How y'all doing tonight? I say, I say y'all is more of like an urban hip thing. Y'all, y'all say it as like a, an actual word, um, which is great. I think, I think southern accents are very charming. I wish I had one myself. Uh, but you all are going to have to, you all, you all are going to have to listen to my sort of boring Chicago accent all weekend. I hope that's okay. Um, well, my name, as, as Trenton said, my name is John, and I am very excited to be with you all all weekend here at DNOW. Uh, and before we start, I do want to play a really quick game. And I'm really hoping in such a big space that this game is going to work, because it's one of my absolute favorite games of all time. Do you all have something on your body that you can crack? Don't do it. But maybe it's your neck, maybe it's your, like, don't break your arm, but like, yeah, not like a broken thumb. But like, if you can crack your knuckles, or you can crack your neck, maybe your back, I don't know. Maybe you have a trick knee, I'm, I'm not sure. Don't crack it yet, because here's what we're going to do. Get it ready, and on the count of three, we're all going to crack at the same time, in complete silence. If you don't like the sound of knuckles or things cracking, we'll pray for you over this next 10 seconds. Here we go. You ready? You ready? I'm going to do my thumb. Absolute silence, or it doesn't work. I'm hoping it works in a big room. Ready? One, two, three. Oh. <laughs> That is the best sound in the world. The best sound. I love it. I love it. All right, so can someone raise their hand and tell me what is the theme of this D Now weekend? Does anyone know what the theme is? Yes. Follow me. Follow me. 10 points for that guy. <laughs> I will be keeping a tally of all of your points all weekend. Follow me. That's right. And we are basing this theme around a verse that you may or may not have heard before. It's found in Luke chapter 9. Verse 23 says this, If anyone, this is Jesus speaking, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So you see, all weekend, we're going to be diving into this verse and hopefully answering the following question. What does it really look like? to follow Jesus? What does it really mean to be a disciple of Christ? For those of you who grew up in church, you've probably heard that phrase, follow Jesus, before. Yes, nod your head if you've heard this. Or maybe you've heard, be a disciple of Jesus. We want to become a good disciple, right? And maybe for you, in growing up, your understanding of what it meant to follow Jesus, maybe for you it simply meant going to church, right? going to church with your family, maybe showing up to youth group, maybe coming to a D-Now weekend. That's what following Jesus meant. Or maybe for you, it simply meant studying your Bible, right? You read the Bible, that means Jesus talks in the Bible, so I'm following Jesus, right? Doing what God said. Or maybe for you, following Jesus, it meant just being a good person, right? Being nice, to your friends, witnessing to your friends, inviting your friends to church. I don't really know what exactly your background is and what exactly your understanding of that phrase, follow Jesus, means. But what I'm here this weekend to suggest to you is very simple. And that is, what if Jesus' invitation to follow him was actually meant to do more than simply change our behavior? What if it was meant to do more than simply change the things we read? What if it was meant to change the way that we interact with other people? But what if it was more than that? What if Jesus' invitation for us to follow him was bigger than that? What if it was actually meant to change us? What if Jesus' call to be his disciple, what if that call was actually meant to change everything for us? That is what we're going to be tackling this D-Now weekend. And this weekend, we're going to be diving into what it looks like to be a true disciple of Jesus. But in order to do that, to start, we're going to look at another passage in the book of Luke. I'm going to read you a short passage you may have heard before from Luke chapter 5, which my Bible gives the title, Jesus Calls His First Disciples. Luke chapter 5 says, One day... Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen. Everyone say fishermen. 
fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Like I said, this weekend we're going to dive into what does it really look like to follow Jesus, right? But before we do that, before we discover what real discipleship looks like, we have to ask ourselves another question, and that first question is, what type of person does Jesus call to follow him? What are the qualifications? Who are the candidates to be a disciple of Jesus? What are the exact prerequisites for enrolling in this course? And so to start us off tonight, we're going to be answering that question through a message that I have entitled, Come After Me. Turn to your neighbor and say, come after me. That's not come at me. That's a whole different type of invitation. Let's pray before we dive in. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for tonight. I thank you for each and every person in this room. God, I truly do. Lord, uh, it has not been easy for any of us to get here. I can complain about canceled flights or, you know, rental cars or La Quinta Inns, but at the end of the day, there are people who walk in here uh, carrying much bigger burdens than difficult travel. God, there are people that walked in here this morning feeling the burden of a broken marriage that their, that their parents are going through right now. There are those who perhaps have lost loved ones in the last year. There are those who just have really difficult friendships or maybe have a relationship with a boyfriend or girlfriend that they're just not feeling right about anymore. I don't know, but we are all walking in here this weekend carrying something. We're all walking in here this weekend following something. And God, I pray as we open up your word tonight, and as I begin speaking, that it would not be me speaking at all, Father, but I pray that you, by the power of your Spirit, would be speaking through me. And God, I pray for each and every person in this room, that those who have ears to hear, that you would let them hear, because I believe you have something for each of us to hear tonight, whether we're a student or a leader. And I pray all of this in the precious name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. So, raise your hand if you love math and you're really good at math. It's okay, you can, you don't, that's great, you're awesome. Like, you're not a nerd, we're not going to make fun of you. That's great if you love math, especially if you're really, really good at math. Good for you, I'm so happy for you. Now, raise your hand if the thought of math makes you want to throw up in a bucket, drink it, and then throw up again. Some of you are like, I don't want to throw up and drink it, but I, I, I do hate math. Yeah, that's me, right? I hate math, and I am atrocious at it. So bad, you wouldn't even believe it. However, when I was in high school, I had this like weird fantasy of being a math genius, right? I really wanted to be that guy who like was just walking down the halls and saw like a really difficult math equation on the board that no one could solve ever. And I just walk in and I'm like, chuk, 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 carry the two, chuk, chuk, chuk. answer. I dreamed of being that guy, but I wasn't very good at math. And the most difficult math course that you could take at my high school was a class called AP Calculus, right? This class was reserved for the best of the best math students. Only the smartest kids were in this class, the real math nerds. You had to have a certain GPA in order to even sign up for this class, right? 
but I wanted to be a math genius. So my senior year, I decided I was going to sign up for AP Calculus, not really thinking I would ever get in, of course, because my GPA wasn't even like half of what you needed to sign up for this class, OK? So I was like, oh, this is a funny joke. I'm going to take AP Calculus. Guess how surprised I was when I got my schedule and first period, I had AP Calculus. I peed my pants a little bit. <laughs> and so I knew immediately from that moment, I am definitely going to be the dumbest kid in the room, right? That's pretty obvious. But I said, OK, I'm going to make up for that by working really, really hard. And so I made a deal with my teacher. Her name was Miss Wiseman. And I made a deal with Miss Wiseman that every single day before school, I would show up at 6 a.m., an hour before school started, and we would work together on extra calculus work so that I could catch up with everyone else. And I was so committed to this. I'm like, Miss Wiseman, I think I'm a math genius. I just need some work. And so for two months, we did this every single morning, Monday through Friday. And after two months, I was still failing AP calculus. And one day, I was waiting for Mrs. Wiseman because she was a little bit late. And when she walked up, she saw me and she just sighed. She went, John, this is an exact quote. This is what she said to me. She said, John, I'm tired. I think you should probably just drop this class. And so I want it to be known. I could still be a math genius, but Miss Wiseman gave up on me. So the world missed out on my genius. And so I dropped AP Calculus. But in all honesty, I really had no business being in this class in the first place, right? This class is reserved for only the best of the best students, only the smartest students. And I just didn't really measure up to that. Now, in order for you to understand this next part, I'm going to need three volunteers. Can I get three volunteers? Raise your hand. Oh, yeah, you three right here. Yeah, three stooges here. Let's go. Let's go, three amigos. All right, y'all come up here. And, and can, you, can you stand sort of right here, in, just in a pack for me? And you, you just stand there. Don't, don't do anything stupid. Just, just stand there. Thank you. So for those of you who don't know, Jesus lived in a time that we call the first century, right? And during the first century, education looked a lot different than it does today. And during the first century, little Jewish boys and girls, or boys, whatever, the little Jewish boys, they would go to school at around six years old for the first time. And at six years old, they would enter in to what is called Beit Sefer. Everybody say Beit Sefer. And in this level of schooling, right, in Beit Sefer, what would happen is little Jewish boys and girls, they would learn for about four or five years, and what they would do is they would memorize the entire Torah. And the Torah is what the word we use to refer to the first five books of the Bible. They would memorize Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy by the age of 10. So we're going to test these guys and see how much of those five books that, no, I'm kidding. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. But by the age of 10, they would have those five books memorized. Now, at this point, most of the students, they would actually drop out of school at 10 years old. And they would go, and they would apprentice, and they would learn a trade, right? They would learn how to be a farmer, or they'd learn how to be a fisherman, or something like that. And they would drop out of school. However, the best of the best would move on. Move here to the center for me. Here we go. This is an illustration. They would move on to the second level of Hebrew school, which was called Beit Talmud. And in Beit Talmud, these students, the best of the best, they would go on and they would memorize not just the first five books of the Bible. They would memorize the entire Old Testament by the age of 15. Genesis through Malachi. I don't know about you, but I couldn't even get the memory verse for the week memorized when I was in Sunday school. But they had the entire Old Testament at 15 years old. Then what would happen is most students, again, they would drop out of school 
and they would go and they would learn a trade, they would become a blacksmith, they would become a farmer, or they would become a fisherman. But the best of the best of the best would go on to level three. And level three was called Beit Midrash. And what happened in Beit Midrash is that the best and smartest students Everyone's looking at him like he's not very smart. <laughs> like this is very ironic that I chose him. I'm not sure why. He's really intelligent. Well, for this example, incredibly intelligent. This was AP calculus, right? And what you would do in Beit Midrash is this student would actually apply to be a rabbi's disciple. And if the rabbi thought, oh, this kid's smart. This kid can do what I do. Because that's what being a disciple means. A disciple is someone who literally follows the rabbi around, does everything the rabbi does, learns everything the rabbi learns, so that eventually one day this disciple can carry on the rabbi's practice. And so a rabbi would only accept someone as their disciple if they thought, this kid can do what I do. And if they thought that, they would say, come, follow me. Let's give a hand to these volunteers. Great job. You guys can have a seat. Excellent job. Excellent. Such smart, smart people. And so now that we understand that, that being invited to be a rabbi's disciple, that this was one of the highest honors that a young Jewish boy or girl could receive, since we understand that this was a very exclusive club, only reserved for the best of the, be of the best, this should completely transform our understanding of that passage in Luke 5 that I read you earlier, right? Because in Luke chapter 5, what do we have? We have Jesus, who is a Jewish rabbi, and we have fishermen, right? And if they're fishermen, what does that mean? It means that they had dropped out of school. It means that these men, Simon and Andrew and James and John, they were not the best of the best of the best. These guys maybe had made it through the first level of Hebrew school. These guys were not special. They were not the smartest. They were not the best. They did not live up to the standard. They didn't fit in to the exclusive club. And yet the story ends with Jesus, a Jewish rabbi, saying to these fishermen, come, follow me. You see, what we have in this story is we have Jesus taking an exclusive club of religion and turning it into an inclusive family of God. And what I mean by that is the traditional idea of a disciple was that you had to live up to a certain standard. You had to know enough. You had to be good enough. You had to be smart enough to get into AP calculus, which not all of us are smart enough, okay, in order to be a disciple. There was only a certain number of people who were invited into this religious club. But Jesus is tearing all of that down here and he is inviting these ordinary, everyday, completely unspecial fishermen into a family of God. And so when Jesus says this to them, when a Jewish rabbi invites these fishermen to come and follow him, what do you think the reaction is? Of course, their minds are literally blown, right? I was always really confused in reading the story and there's, there's a parallel version of this story in Matthew. And it talks about how, how Simon, Simon's father is there as well. And, and literally, Jesus just says, follow me. And the guys are like, great, let's go follow this stranger. I always found that very confusing. Why would they, after five minutes with Jesus, I know he performed a miracle, and that's great, but why after five minutes would they just drop everything they'd ever known so that they could go follow this strange man? But you see, when a Jewish rabbi comes to them, these fishermen, and says, come, follow me, this was the absolute highest honor 
that these young boys could imagine. This was an honor that they never imagined that they would receive. This is an honor that they knew that they did not deserve. And so, of course, immediately, they will drop everything and go and follow him because they weren't special. They weren't the best. They were ordinary. And so, again, what we have in this story is that in a world of the best calling the best, Jesus is an extraordinary God calling ordinary people. And friends, if you want to know the answer to the question we asked earlier, if you want to know what type of person Jesus calls to follow him, Jesus calls ordinary people. Jesus isn't just interested in the smartest or the most popular or the person who gets the best grades or the person with the most talent or the person with the best looks. But Jesus calls ordinary, everyday people And not only that, but Jesus actually calls the ordinary to the extraordinary. And you might not understand that right now, but let me explain. Do you remember earlier when I was talking about how when a rabbi would invite the disciple to be their disciple, they would only do it if they thought, this kid can do what I do? Remember that? So in light of that, When Jesus says to these fishermen, come, follow me. When Jesus says to these ordinary men, come, be my disciple, what Jesus is actually saying here is, hey, fisherman, hey, Simon, hey, ordinary, hey, unspecial person, I actually think that you can do what I do. I think that you can serve the way that I serve. I think that you can love people the way that I love people. I think that you can teach the way that I teach. You see, what Jesus does is he says, I know that you might feel ordinary. I know that right now in your life you might feel unspecial. I know that you might feel like you don't live up to the standard. But if you make the decision to follow me, I will take your ordinariness and I will bring you on a journey of an extraordinary life. That's what following Jesus does. You see, maybe you're in this room tonight and you don't feel very special, right? You you know you're definitely not the smartest kid in your school. You know that you're not the most talented. Maybe maybe you've never been picked for anything, right? The sports team, school play, I don't know, whatever it is. You know that you're not the most popular. You don't have the most friends. Heck, you might not even feel like your parents' favorite. Maybe you're in this room tonight and you feel utterly ordinary. And if that's true, then I want you to hear this. I want you to know that if you feel ordinary, then Jesus' call is for you. Come, follow me. I think you can do the things that I do. And if you make the decision to come and follow me, I will take that ordinariness. I will take your ordinary life and I will begin to transform it into something extraordinary. That is what Jesus does when we make the decision to follow him. Jesus is an extraordinary God calling ordinary people to follow him. And friends, true discipleship means following Jesus. True discipleship means coming after Jesus because the gospel is a story of a Jesus who first came after us. You see, the gospel is the story of a God who even in our sin, even in our brokenness, even in our utter ordinariness, came down to earth and came after us. Again, maybe you're here this weekend and you look at your life and it's not necessarily that you feel ordinary, but you certainly don't feel like God would ever call you to follow him because you've actually been running away from God for the last year. 
Maybe you look at your life over the last year and you look at the decisions you've been making or some of the friendships that you've made or some of the words that you've been saying and you realize you've actually been running away from God. You've been running in sin. You've been running in shame. You've been running in fear. But you see, the story of the gospel is that even in our running, God came after us by sending his one and only son to die on a cross. So that even in our running, even in our shame, even in our sin, even in our utter ordinariness, we could be forgiven for that sin and we could be freed to follow him. You want to know the type of person that Jesus calls to be his disciple. He calls ordinary people. You want to know who Jesus says, come, follow me? He says it to us. Everyday, ordinary, broken, messed up people like you and me.